and a warm welcome to Nicole Kraus, Naya Marie Eid. We have been uh, celebrating also these days the first novel by Naya Marie Eid, who is best known as a poet, a, a theatre writer, a theatre radio playwright, uh, well, almost any genre except for the novel. Mm -hmm. And we have, of course, also been celebrating Great House, but not so much your poetry, because actually you started out as a poet. Yeah, that was a long time ago. That was a long time. Well, you're so young, you, can, you have no right to say that was so long time ago <laughs> yet. <laughs> but you did start out as that. What, what yeah. made you change your mind and turn into a novelist? Uh, I've reached a point in the poetry, having started when I was a teenager, and wanting nothing more in the world than to be a poet. I found somehow that I was trapped in the work. And the thing I understand now about writing, almost more than anything else, is that it's about a kind of freedom. And if you don't have that freedom, if you lose it, the writing is no longer worth anything to you. And I can't explain exactly what happened, but it's something to do with feeling that the poem had to be perfect, or that there was a possibility for perfection in a poem. And I had this idea, I had a friend who was writing a novel, and I thought, well, maybe this will be an escape hatch, and I'll just try to write a novel, and it will be a way to find the freedom and come back into writing poetry. And I discovered two things. One is that novels are always endlessly imperfect. So suddenly there was enormous relief. There's no perfect novel. I, I challenge all of you to name a perfect novel. They don't exist. And knowing that there are going to be failures setting out is liberating. And this brings me back to this sense of freedom. I just felt this rush of freedom again as a writer. And, and I never turned back. Could you point at a perfect poem? I think there are so many perfect poems. I think it's not that poems themselves are small, because we all know they can contain infinity. But there's a sense in which, you know, stanza in Italian means room. And I always thought of poems as rooms in, in a way that you could arrange everything exactly perfectly. It could be just right. And yet, when you close the door of that room, you never go back again. I think W.H. Auden said, you're only a poet for the five minutes after you've written a poem, and then you never know if you're going to write one again. But a novel is like a house. And if you, any of you who have lived in houses know there's always something broken. The window is you know, stuck, and the garage door doesn't work. But it's just imperfect, but you can make a life there. And I just find that, I find that still now comforting. Do you recognize any of what uh, Nicole is saying? Because you have been uh, sticking with uh, the poetry for a long time. Long, like 20 years. Like yeah. 20 years. But um, actually, I started writing prose short stories in the first place because I, I was so <coughs> mad at my own po poetry and so not satisfied with it. So I, I thought I could kind of do short stories and then go back to poetry and do mm. perfect poetry, mm. which I couldn't, of course. But, I mean, poetry doesn't have to be po perfect, I think. I feel the opposite way, in a way. I mean, this is my first novel, so who knows what's going to happen next, but... We have to explain that it's not really out yet. It's going to be out on the 30th of August, so nobody, ha if nobody has read it. No. Except for Naya and me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I do feel that poetry is completely freedom to me, mm. you know, mm. and, um, and I don't know how, why and how, but it feels like that it's, it, you, can, you can walk straight into a poem and you can end it like with like no ending. It can just hang, you know, in, in, in the air as something like a touch or a bird or whatever. Mm. And, and the structure of a collection of poetry can be so mm, weird in a way, you know? You can make everything, you can connect everything, even though you can't really connect it. It's difficult for me to talk about, but I think actually that when I read Great House, you're doing the same thing, because you have all these different um, stories and uh, characters, and you have the disc, and um, in the first place, when I read it, I thought it was like um, short stories, connected short stories in a way that because they're so beautifully written, so you can actually read every uh, part of it as a short story. Mm. But then there's this connection between everything. 
at the same time. Mm. So to me, it was poetry in a way. Yeah, as you're describing this, I guess what you would call uh, um, the chance for irresolution or the need not to resolve things. Exactly. For me, that's, that's how I would describe writing novels. And I think that the more I write and the older I get, the less I trust resolution mm -hmm. at all and the more comfortable I feel with the questions. And I don't, I don't go to books, whether it be a book of poetry or, or a book of fiction, for answers no. necessarily. I go to them for the opportunity to ask and to dwell on the questions. So I think, yeah, I mean, when I'm writing, certainly in Great House, but always, there is this kind of pursuit of that uncertainty and how long can one hang there and how uncomfortable can that get? Mm -hmm. But yet something <laughs> about that feels honest to me. Yeah, because there's no endings in life either. I mean, only when we die, and that's not even an ending because mm -hmm. somebody else is going to live on. So Be my frustration about um, writing this novel was that it felt like I have to end it somehow. You know, <laughs> this is going to be like an mm -hmm. ending. And I was so frustrated about it and, and angry, actually. So I kind of turned it into something else, I hope. But, um, but you know, um, the feeling that I had to leave the characters and the story behind was so completely different from leaving a um, collection of poetry behind because I never leave them behind, you know? They keep, they linger in my head mm -hmm. for a long, long time. And um, mm -hmm. so, but I, I really, I do understand what you mean by um, freedom because you create this enormous world and and you can stay there for a very long time. And yeah. that is such a relief in a way. And there's also, I think, the opportunity in, in fiction to really become other people. And I never felt that in poetry. I mean, the poetic eye is, it may leap farther from yourself, but somehow it's always bound to you. And you don't have the same opportunity to, for example, become in a really profound, intimate way, an old man, for example, or father, if you happen to be a mother, or whatever it is, you know? And that chance to step inside another person's mind and feel what it's like there, and feel the places of yourself that overlap with that person and the places which um, you have to become larger to, to, to yeah, incorporate yeah. that person. I agree. I find that um, thrilling mm -hmm. as a, as a novel. Too. Yeah. <coughs> do you ever do you ever have the feeling of anger when you're writing? I just picked up the word from you. You were angry and frustrated at your novel at a certain point. Do you, do, you do I get angry? Um, <laughs> I get sad a lot. I mean, I just this is feeling of like this is just never going to work out, and I get terrified a lot because of the same reason. The sent the feeling that because I'm not I, I'm not the kind of writer who works according to a plan and, and I don't know what, where I'm going when I set out, it's always this feeling of like walking a tightrope and it's just one wrong step and it just it could not work. I remember, you know, for example, the history of love. Here I had these, these interweaving stories and I had Leo Gersky and Alma Singer and I knew that for the book to work they had to come together. I had no idea how to make that happen. Mm. And I remember walking around Manhattan one day, walking on 23rd Street, and suddenly it hit me, because I couldn't figure out how to make two characters speak at the same time, and I knew that was the only way to kind of end the book, that they had to both share that same moment. And suddenly it dawned on me that they could each have one side of a page, so that one would be kind of echoing each other typographically, and that was it, and suddenly I knew that the book would survive, and it wouldn't be a total failure. But I don't know, that even having said all of that, and about the terror and the sadness or the worry, I think the possibility for failure actually is kind of exciting in a perverse way. <laughs> um, there's, I have this wonderful uh, lithograph at home on my wall that's by an artist, Tom Phillips, and it has, it's the back of Samuel Beckett's head <laughs> watching a, a rehearsal of Waiting for Godot, and it's a quote from one of Beckett's novels, and it's um, try, fail, try again, fail better. And I think that that sense of, you know, failing better each time in the novel, when you think of it like that, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's just, um, it's exciting, I guess. You feel that anything can happen. 
Yes, sir, you, you said that you got a bit claustrophobic about being inside a male character for a couple of years. How, how is that, how is it, is it different to write about men and women? Not really. And I was amazed that it wasn't actually. It was pretty easy for me to be him. And I enjoyed it, um, mostly. He's not a nice guy. He is, in a way. He's, he's a guy, he, he doesn't know how to, how, he, he's always like outside of the world. He's not able to find that contact. Mm. And I know a lot about that, right? <laughs> so he's always trying to, um, um, to connect with other people, but it's so difficult for him. So in a way, he's a nice, he's a, I love him very much, but at the same time, he's not a, a very nice guy at all because he doesn't know how to live his life and he doesn't know how to escape his childhood and he doesn't know how to, um, to, to be generous. Nicole's great house is a lot about a disc mm -hmm. and I have a toaster. <laughs> so, and, and the Tosa is somehow the, the main character. What both your novels uh, are about, namely uh, the uh, difficulty of communication between people. Mm. Be it family, lovers, whatever, communication is so difficult. Mm. Is that uh, a good theme for you both? Can you say something about that? Yeah, I think it's a good theme for me at least. I mean... <clears throat> I think everything I ever written is about that. Mm. Um, how people communicate or how they do not communicate, how they're not able to communicate, and how um, they live together or wish to live together or whatever. But um, it's so interesting that you can never stop writing about it. I mean, and it's, it's so sad in a way that it's so difficult for people to communicate, right? I mean, even within your own family sometimes. Often? Very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you also both write about families. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. That is no, I think this is kind of, I mean, I think you, you become a writer in part because you feel that, it, that what is available to you in life is not sufficient to explain yourself or to understand other people. So you need something else, you need something more, and, and you need more hours of the day to dedicate to it. You need more words and more words and new ways of saying things. And I think there is this incredible longing when you're a writer to have that intense contact. And the, and the strange, the irony of it all is that when you write a book, and you put it out into the world, you're not there when that moment <laughs> happens. You know, you, you don't get to, to be witness to, you're having this conversation with, with, with all of these people, and you're not there for it, or you're only there for it um, in, the, in the years when you write the book, and the rest of the mm -hmm. conversation happens without you, except in these lucky moments when you get to meet readers, and they ask you a question, or you begin to talk. But I think, you know, books, novels tend to be filled with lonely people, because the world is filled with lonely people but also because writers are engaged with this incredibly difficult labor of what it is to drag everything that is in one mind over to another mind, whether it's from the author's mind into the reader's mind, or whether it's a, between a father and a son, as I just read. Whatever it is, I think we, we all recognize, readers and writers, that that isn't easy work, but that is the most that we can hope for. It's what we value in life, it's what we're here for, is to have not just a solipsistic experience of our lives, but this enriching communication or contact. When I sit down to write a book, I, I, I hope that I will discover things that I didn't know in advance. I certainly have no sense at all, not just of the narrative and the characters and what will happen to them, but about what the whole thing means. But that is the, well, that, that is the work, and that's what's interesting about it and exciting about it. And it's like, you know, you, you finish a novel and you have not just this photograph of yourself, it's even more complex than that. You have like this blueprint of how your mind works and what it's been thinking about all these years. And otherwise, I wouldn't know that about myself. And, and, and also, you can't hide from it. You know, like the, what I care about, what I think about, is all, all in this book, whether I'd like to admit it or not. And so, no, it's certainly the idea of the burden of inheritance, for example, which we spoke about. Mm. No, if, if someone had said to me, now, write a novel about the burden of inheritance, I would have said, 
<laughs> what? 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 <laughs> like now, what does that mean? But but when you do it this way, where you're you're slowly stitching together all these bits and pieces and images and ideas and um, music and thoughts and observations, and you're making patterns between them, and you're creating meaning. Then, then all of this kind of this subtle thing begins to unfurl itself. Just to give you one example, I had um, this idea in my mind, a number of ideas that were rolling around my mind when I started the book, and very s simple or strange things. And one of them was of um, a stone being thrown through a window. There's something about that, like the thrill of it crashing through a window. And then I began to imagine a situation where you have a family, in this case a Jewish family, in 1944 in, in Budapest, and they're about to be arrested by the Gestapo. If, if the Gestapo were to throw a stone through the window, where does the stone land? Because it's thrown in one life for this family, but the moment afterwards it's a different life. One life is ended, another begins. They just sort of thought about that idea, it was a kind of riddle. And then in this very subtle way, the stone began to land throughout the book. It crashed through one person's window and it hit a windshield. And again, I wasn't conscious of doing that. I just found myself thinking about this image. And much later, after the book, I can say, okay, after the book is finished, I can say, oh, this is a book about the aftermath or the consequences of these dramatic moments in history and how they, the repercussions of how they fall through the generations and through lives. But it was the stone first that gave me that I that led me to that idea. Do you recognize this pattern of, of writing, or did you have? Yeah, a lot. Did you have a? No, no plan, never. A plan no. to satisfy the no. journalist? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have one because then it wouldn't be as interesting for me. Because it is like, like Nicole is describing it. Uh, you you you're searching for something and you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. and and that's why. I've, I've found it very hard in the beginning because I didn't know why I was re writing this story. And I, you know, ha why the toaster? It's ridiculous, you know? It's, <laughs> it was so frustrating, but I, at the same time, I knew I had to keep up, keep doing it, because I've been a writer for so long. I know that, you know, I just have to continue doing it, and then at some point, I'll see what the pattern is. And so what, what happened to about. the toaster? What happened to the toaster? The toaster. <laughs> um, the main character and his sister is their father dies in prison. That's mm. the beginning of the story, and um, and they found they find a, a, an old toaster in in the in his apartment, and uh, the sister wants it so bad because it reminds her of. Uh, toasting bread as a child, mm. and you know the father was not a very good father, so that was kind of, it's a very sentimental memory for her, mm. and and it doesn't work. So she asks her brother to fix it, mm. and he unscrews the whole thing, and it's filled with money, mm. lots of money, and he takes them, and and you know he he is a man who really escaped his childhood. He he haven't. Um, been seeing his father for many, many, many years. He hates him, but suddenly he enrules himself um, into something criminal, just like what he hates about his mm -hmm. father. So it, it's you know, so he's kind of yeah. I don't know how to describe it's it. A, and you it's, know, a, it's a fatal toaster. Mm -hmm. It's a fatal yeah, it's stupid a, it toaster. Him stupid it is fatal. Downhill. But. As the book has not come out yet, I don't know what to say about it, to right. be honest, because Let's I don't not know say it anything. yet. Mm. You know what I mean? Forget I, the toaster. <laughs> no, because I'm, I think it's very essential and very important what Nicole just said, that mm. you don't, you, you, it takes time to find out what you did, mm. and I don't know yet. I just know that I followed this, this, this trail or this, um, this road or wh whatever, and it turned out to be this book. And I'm, these days, I'm thinking a lot about the, the structure and the patterns and how everything is connected. And, you know, I heard David Van yesterday talking about the same thing, that the unconsciousness or whatever it is might be something in the brain, that, that it's, it, 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 somehow you don't know what you're doing, but it works, you know? <laughs> I mean, because it is 
everything is there is a it, it is um, a very special system almost, and everything turns out to be balanced in special ways and I didn't know I was writing about gender, for instance, but this is really about gender also. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things, you just, I, I just, I felt that I knew that I, you know, I have to do this and the next scene is going to be this, but I had no idea mm. why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and it's probably also worth add, adding, because I'm listening to all of you listening to us, and we're making it sound a little bit like we're just fairies idiots. maybe in a room, yeah. and we just <laughs> make it, it sort of unrolls for us. But I think there is, even when you don't know where you're going, there's endless recalibration and yes. calculation, and, and, and you're playing on the level of the sentence, you know, with such fine things, you know, and y I mean, I don't know how you work, but I have a, a trash file that's as long as this novel, that the dead ends that I went in and it didn't work, and so I had to throw it away, or things that I tried to pursue, but it didn't work out, and, and so it's not, it isn't that the thing magically un unrolls. It's more hard work than magic. It's hard work, magic. it's hard work, yeah. but it is, but, it, but you have to still, having said that, you, you have to put yourself in the position for the accident to happen. It's, it's funny because I read something about both of you that I don't know if it has to do with writing, but it made me think of Murakami who has written a book about running mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you both jog. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you still mm -hmm. jog, but I know that you jog in order to clear your mind. Is that part of the uh, process that, that this physical thing has to be there in order to get to the more spiritual side of, of writing or is it just... Um, well, I think fit. it's not. It's good. It's. I mean, I don't run anymore, but I think it is a wonderful thing to do. But no, there are there are things one needs to balance it. I mean, I'm in the middle of books now, and, and which is always a hard period. And so I started to to learn how to play piano, which has kind of been an amazing balance. So in the afternoons, I'm working on, I'm practicing piano, and and I dance in the evening. So just anything that that is gets me out of my mind, mm -hmm. it's necessary. Yeah. And for both of you, the reading has been crucial. It's a way to read, which is different, I think, from the way people who don't write read. It's a way of learning how to write. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? You've read always. Always, yeah. But it was very emotional to start with. I was raised in Greenland, and the winters are very long and very dark, and you can't really go outside for a long time because it's too cold. So what can you do? So my parents read us stories, Always, you know, every day, lots of stories. Mm -hmm. And the people in Greenland tell that there's a huge tradition of storytelling in the culture. So I was raised with it, and, and I couldn't wait till I was able to write myself. And I started writing before I could even spell. So it's like impossible to read, but the urge <laughs> was so strong. strong. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very connected. So it, it was nice memories connected to my family and my parents and the people around me. And I think that's, that's what set me off. So as a teenager, I just started to read completely like a mad woman. I mean, <laughs> everything, right? And I, I can't imagine a life without reading. For me, it's almost, it's information and it's art, and it's, but it's also meditation in a way, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. How's that for you, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, I, c I can't imagine life without it. I, I always ask myself those difficult questions, like if I could, if one of them was taken away, like <laughs> if I couldn't, I could only be a reader or only be a writer, I'd rather be a reader. Absolutely, no question about it. But um, luckily, nobody's put that to me <laughs> yet. <laughs> luckily to Not us? Yet. Yeah, <laughs> well. Um, but, you know, the strange thing that has happened to me as time has passed is, I don't read the way I used to read in, in the way that you described as a child, which is how we all start. I mean, something changed along the way, and of course I love to read, but I read now looking for different things. And I might be drawn to a writer who, um, I don't know, like a couple of years ago I became totally obsessed with Thomas Bernhardt and read every one of his books to the point of uh, nausea, really. Um, but. I became fascinated with his sentences. I, I don't know anybody else who writes like him. The rhythm of his sentences is so strange, and his sentences become about the rhythm themselves. And he was trained you know, as an opera singer. His books are very, very musical. 
but the sense lies often in the rhythm. And that fascinates me as a writer. And I don't know, I mean, I, I would push his books on everybody and often get, you know, blank stares. I mean, who, who should, everybody should love Thomas Bernhard, but I've got a lot of blank stares from him. <laughs> and I understand that. There's something endlessly stubborn about him. And he doesn't set out to charm or entertain. And in our, our times, um, being charming and entertaining seems to be important somehow. But it wasn't to him, and I, and that w I, I was sort of fascinated by that as a writer. But do you, do you feel precise influences from somebody when you end your novel and reread, or I mean, when you talk about this sentence, the rhythm, this, do you know? Do you say, oh, I made a Bruno Schulz here, or here's a? Well, I don't know. I always think it's odd that writers. Um, I mean, it, when musicians talk, they're constantly talking about their influences, and writers seem very, very protective of the idea that mm. they were, sp were sprung out of this kind of solitude, as if they had no influences. And and I, I love to be influenced. I, I mean, I think it's wonderful because like doors open, and now I have a chance to try that or write like that. And it doesn't. Uh, you never escape your own voice and your own mind. You can only ever write what you are and who you are. But it's nice to encounter a writer who suddenly makes you feel that everything is possible again, or there's a way of doing it that you never thought of. And you don't do it like that. You can't do it like that. You wouldn't want to do it like that. But something about that example gives you this kind of energy or um, ex new excitement about the work. Yeah. Did, you have, did, did you have any specific writer in mind when you said, OK, I'm going to do this novel, finally? No. 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 On purpose, no, <laughs> because otherwise I couldn't have done it. I mean, you can't, co you can't copy anything. I mean, it's impossible. And you can't write when you're, if you're thinking about that everybody else is much better than you, right? So, no. But I do find uh, inspiration in, in all kinds of art, actually, not, not only writing. And, and the thing about no, reading, um, the thing about reading is that it's not like, I don't feel reading is like when I was a child anymore, not even as a teenager, because at that time I was reading very fast and I was reading everything. And now I'm very selective and I read very slow because I want to, I can't, you know, I want to read every sentence and I want to, you know, it's like, um, not a desiccation, but it's like, what is he or she doing? Yeah. Right? I have to it's the out. same. You, you want you, mm -hmm. the skill of mm -hmm. it also. The it's skill of it, or to yeah. see why do I feel so? Um, why is this so hard gripping, or why is this so um, disgusting, or what is it? Right. Mm -hmm. So in that way, reading is not as much fun as it used to be. But <laughs> but when you find something that you love, then it's like a jewel. It's like it's even better, right? Yeah. Because. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's uh, not as uh, often anymore. Mm. I think this uh, is about it, mm. because we have at least learned that the lucky ones are the readers, because you're not <laughs> writers, you. so you can just keep on reading like you were children. <laughs> and I will say to you, you should read these novels and the ones to come. Thank you very much Thank for joining you. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.